coming up with the talk, and we're going to be um, live streaming it, not live streaming, streaming at a later date so that anybody who's not presently here with us can join in the conversation. We do welcome you to continue <coughs> tweeting and Facebooking about this event. If you do tweet, please use hashtag one of these things, or all of them. Encuentro 2014, hashtag Cafe Onda, or hashtag HowlRound TV. Okay? Oh, we are live! Never mind! We're live, you guys! Oh, we're live. oh in that case! So for anybody out there, for anybody out there, if you want to join in the conversation, please tweet us, Facebook us, we'll let us know your, your, your topic. Um, these events are all being produced by Latino Theater Commons, not the shows, but these events. And um, the Latino Theater Commons is a group of artists, activists, scholars, and administrators from all over the country. Most of our work is on the phone and online. Um, who are working to advocate for Latino theater in the United States. So if we have any steering committee members here in the room, can we just have them stand? Just have them stand really fast. <laughs> Many of these lovely people also help champion a Tertulia event or more. So, uh, so they're kind of responsible for this, which is awesome. All right, please leave your cell phones on between the vibrate. And with that, I give you Dr. Chantal Rodriguez. <laughs>
excited to begin this conversation and I really want to involve the audience, but first I just wanted to take advantage of having these distinguished panelists with us today. And I wanted to ask each author specifically, sort of, if you could tell us a bit about your book, how it came about, what was the process um, and impetus for your book, and maybe we can start with Sonia telling us about Enrique's journey and your process in bringing these stories um, into your work. Uh, well, it's, it's kind of a long story. Uh, in 1997, uh, we, we think of this issue of unaccompanied children, um, you know, it's been very much in the news this summer, and in fact, I went back to Honduras uh, in June to report a piece for the New York Times, but uh, in this has been an issue for a long time. Uh, in 1997, I was having a conversation with a woman, uh, Gagnon, who would clean my house a couple of times a month here in LA, and she was trying to figure out what was wrong with me because I had been married seven years, Latina, no babies. Uh, and uh, Carmen, I seemed like a very nice person, but all of this added up to that there was some horrific monster lurking within, so she was trying to figure out what was wrong with me. And um, that morning in my kitchen, she popped the question, you know, Missy Sonia, cuando va a tener un baby? And I didn't want to answer, so I redirected to her and um, said, what about you, Carmen? Are you gonna have more than this one? son that I know about, and she started crying. And she explained to me that she'd left four children behind in Guatemala, single mother, her husband had left her, and she said that she could feed them once, sometimes twice, but that always her children would start crying with hunger at night, and she had nothing to give them. And she showed me in my kitchen that morning how she would um, coax them to roll over in bed at night and tell her children, uh, sleep face down so that your stomach doesn't growl so much. Um, a year later, her son came up on his own to come and find her. Um, he said he came up on a series of buses, but that there were lots of kids coming to find their mothers on this odyssey on top of freight trains, um, and that they faced bandits and gangsters and corrupt cops, and many of them lost their lives and their limbs to this journey. And um, I just thought it was an incredible story of, uh, and you know, honestly, when my house cleaner told me the story, I was quite judgmental towards her. I, I remember thinking to myself, what kind of a crappy mother leaves their children? But when I went to Honduras to report this, uh, I saw that the women who stayed in Honduras, they, um, their children often worked in this terrible dump. And I would see kids as young as six years old working in this dump to try to be able to eat. and. Um, so I came to really understand her decision a lot, a lot better. But what I saw uh, reporting this was that there are millions of women who had come here from Mexico, Central America, left their children behind. And when I started reporting this story, actually in 2000, um, there was probably a, a, an army of children coming north without a parent uh, and entering the U.S. unlawfully, uh, about 48,000. And today it's hundreds of thousands of children coming in this way. Uh, so we've seen about a tenfold increase just in the last three years of these children coming north. And the reasons why they're coming, unfortunately, have uh, changed quite dramatically. Before they were coming, you know, they wouldn't, like Enrique, would not see their mothers for five or 10 years in despair and set off on their own to come find their moms. Um, today, you know, when he came, it was largely family reunification to work and in many cases to flee abusive situations in their home countries, in countries that really don't have very functioning child welfare systems. Going back, I went back in June to uh, Enrique's home in Honduras, and I spent a, a week living in his grandmother's home, and uh, saw a huge change in what's sparking this exodus of um, the narcos uh, cartels have really, Mexican cartels have moved massively into Central America. We've spent $8 billion, the U.S., to disrupt the flow of uh, cocaine up the Caribbean corridor from Colombia, uh, but the narcos has simply rerouted inland to Central America, and um, they are trying to control this turf, and the children are their foot soldiers, so they are recruiting children in these elementary schools at eight, 10 years old, demanding that they use marijuana, crack, get them hooked, and then have them work as uh, lookouts um, selling drugs in these neighborhoods and ultimately as sicarios, as um, killers for the cartels. So I saw in, in many of these countries, Honduras now has the number one homicide rate in the world. It's second only in daily body count to Syria. Um, and I was glad to get out of there alive after one week. Uh, I wasn't sure I was gonna make it. So uh, very drastic changes and 
Uh, you know, as a journalist, I was trained not to be an advocate and lived for 25 years not being an advocate and in uh, recent months have become very vocal, uh, speaking before the Senate, the UN, um, in many media outlets, perhaps more important than the Senate and, and, and the UN on Jon Stewart's Daily Show. <laughs> so, uh, really <laughs> saying how these children really are very different from economic migrants. They are refugees who in many cases are running for their lives and have governments that cannot or will not protect them. So I've become very vocal in advocating for these children. shameless woman. So let me ask you, Tony, as, as a collaborator, sort of how did you come to find out about this work? And what was it about the work that drew you to specifically create a piece of theater around it? And, and what do you think theater can bring to this story that television and film you know, could not, or some other kind of medium cannot express? Um, it, it's a weird kind of story, actually. Um, I, was, I got a call in April of 2011, and it was a friend of mine theater department, she said, have you heard of Enrique's journey? And sadly to say, I had not. And she said, well, I'm working with a college in Southern Colorado, and the author, Sonia Nazario, is coming in, and it's this incredible story, and they want to do an adaptation, and I think you're the guy, you should be the guy to do it. And so I asked him to send me the book, and, well, I got the book, I got a copy of the book, and, and I read it, and, and, and then we set up a, a, a phone call, and they, they said, well, we'd like you to do it, but here's the thing, you have 45 days to get it done. Uh, and, and so Sonia and I had a, a, a we had that, remember that, that conference call kind yeah. of a thing? And it was interesting with the collaborators who were non-Latinos in the Southern Colorado, they were very nice people, but I think there was, a, there was something that hit between Sonia and I, I was able to ask her questions about what I thought was at, the, at, at, at some of the cores because of her relationship with, because first of all, I thought she was crazy, right? Because after after she she met Enrique on the border, she then went and traveled the train and met all these people. The whole drama scene was based on you got hit with the branch, right? Almost swiped off, yeah. Almost swiped off, and it was like, man, she's the craziest. She's the bravest and the craziest person I ever met in my life, right? <laughs> or ever talked to. And so, uh, so I said, yeah, I want to do it. Let's do it. But and and it was like, but the the, the best thing about it for me is that as I read through it. Uh, is that I, I took, there's a lot of Sonia's dialogue in this in the piece. There's, you can almost open the book any place and go, oh, that's that scene, oh, that's that scene. And as I was watching it this time, I was going, did I make that up or was that in the book? And I was that, is that, is that mine or is that, and I, and so I, 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 I when I read it, what I found was this was a really good, good writer. Because I'm a writer, if you're a writer out there, you like good writing, right? And when you read it, you go, you know what it is, right? And for me, it was it was a question of of honoring that and 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 following that story. It, it, I, I don't want to say it was easy, but but there wasn't this thing that I felt like I had to kind of try a different direction. She had already set the direction, and my job was to just kind of kind of follow what was already laid out for that, and 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 then, and then put it on stage. Uh, I would say the only difference is is some things. Um, that I, I twistedly find funny in this, you know, where the boy is at a funeral and he's die, crying for his father and he, I mean, for his uncle, and he meets, he meets a girl and he hits on her immediately, right? That's a, I can understand that thing, but I still think it's kind of funny and kind of weird. And, and those were the things that I think broke it up for us. That's one of the biggest things that we can do in the terms of the, the stage is that we can, when you put those those realities on, on the stage and then you just take a look at them and you have some perspective, then the full picture kind of opens itself up. Yeah, that was a beautiful moment and I was very struck by the urgency of life in, in that place, right? How that, he's only 17, forget, right? He's so, he's grown up so quickly. But this urgency to continue life and, and to continue making connection and relationships and we see her get pregnant and sort of about, you know, life is gonna continue, but they, have so little time to do it. So I thought it was a beautiful moment. Um, and there was some really nice levity that you brought to the piece, so I congratulate you on that for sure. Yeah, actually, it's in the book. It just doesn't always come out that way. No, you, you definitely brought it out. <laughs> I think that's a good thing, because it can be a very, you know, 
it goes from bad to worse, to, to right. really bad, and um, so I think that that helps. Great. So for those of you who, uh, who are not aware, so the Encuentro we've had, or it's a month-long festival, and we're right smack in the middle of it now. So we were blessed to have um, Pregones Theater and Chantai Theater from Puerto Rico. They both arrived yesterday. So Pregones Theater, their show Dancing in My Cockroach Killers, will open this coming week, and they'll have a two-week run. Um, so you haven't had a chance to see it, but now after today you're going to run and buy tickets. So I wanted to um, ask Magdalena first if she could tell us a little bit about Shameless Woman, give us sort of a background about what is this collection about, um, and then I'll, I'll ask Rosalba how she sort of uh, was drawn to it and adapted it into a musical. So can you tell us a little bit about yes, Shameless Woman? Yes, I, I write in response to tyranny, violence against women. I, I write in response to the despair that we're all feeling underneath and not quite knowing how to handle as the world around us has a nervous breakdown. Mm -hmm. And it's something I've been doing since I was a young girl. Um, I believe, like yourselves, in the interplay of humor and horror because the things that are surrounding us are so, so horrific. And the stories uh, that uh, you have so eloquently written about, um, they are horrific. And thank you for bringing the humor to that because it, 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 has, it is relentless what we have to face on a daily basis. And what I personally face um, as a young girl growing up in a uh, climate of violence in my home, in my community, and in my world. And so my writing began as an act of self-defense. And then my writing turned into an act of defense against others who were being oppressed, subjected to tyranny or violence. And so it, this book, it, it is the interplay of humor and horror. Um, and it is a book where love and rage have found a safe place to meet. And my, my poetry has a lot of humor. Um, I, I, I wrote this book. This particular collection spans the 1970s. I started being a performance poet in 1971. I, I write poetry, I write plays. Why I write more, I work, I work more with poetry, it is accessible to everyone. Poetry goes across class, is accessible, and you can take it anywhere. Uh, I don't have to worry about whether it's gonna be staged or not staged, although now I'm very fortunate that it is being staged. <laughs> um, you know, uh, poetry is, uh, a, it has always been a tool of resistance, if we, we think of, of the great you know, poets, um, uh, revolutionary poets like Otto René Castillo, for example, uh, Roque Dalton, uh, there, there are many. Um, so for me, this book covers issues of family, of war, but not only the big wars, the little wars of the everyday, those little indecencies that we as human beings commit against each other on a daily basis that are so nuanced and that we really do not really pay attention to. I like to put a little magnifying glass on those little moments of indecencies, those little moments of desprecios, all those little things that add up into that big picture that erases and begins to erase empathy, human empathy. I think it's an emergency right now that we recover our empathy and that those of us who work with young people talk about empathy, model empathy. Um, and so I believe that Pregones has done a beautiful, beautiful job in creating a balance of um, you know, the, the humor and the horror in the staging of this work and the performance of this work. I have always written poetry for the stage. It has always been my intention that my poetry be performed. And I performed it myself for years because no one else would. And I have been told all of my life, many, many times by many directors, I love your work, but I don't know where to place it in the season. So I say, it's time for a new season. <laughs> so I thank Rosalba Rolón and people like Miriam Colón and people like Daniel Jaques who have fearlessly taken on my work, that work that I have been told will scare audiences in this country, this work that cannot fit anywhere, this work that is you know, scary to direct, scary to produce, will the audiences come? 
Well, Rosalba, Miriam Colon, Daniel Jaques, they have proven that yes, my work speaks to a diversity of people and the audiences do come. And I am one very, very grateful woman for these people in my life. Select uh, in our master artist project, our art master artist for 2012. I always forget 11 or 12. Uh, we thought I immediately our team said it needs to be Magdalena Gomez. Every year we select an artist, a writer or a performer or a musician, a composer, um, and we honor that person with a very modest fellowship. But the one gift that we give them is the, the possibility to showcase the work to the audience. And so in our case, when we're working with a writer, we offer them, if they want, uh, to either bring their own piece already staged, or for our ensemble, who's ready to sitting right here, mm -hmm. here <laughs> to, um, to perform their work. And more often than not, they say we'd love for Fregones to, to do it. You know, and that's the big gift in terms of what we bring to the table. We have been adapting pro uh, works uh, 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 from non-dramatic texts and from poetry since we began 35 years ago, and a lot of our work are collection pieces. I am in love with short stories that can be put together like a necklace, you know? And, and that together create an arc of a larger story. I also love single story plays, of course, we have them, we have those. But those are somehow, that's how we started, and we continue to do that. Now let me uh, give a little bit, perhaps, of the background, because this, uh, that's in my cockroach killers, did not come out of specifically about, from this publication, you know, in fact. Uh, when we, I told Magdalena, I said, Magdalena, you're the master artist for us uh, this year, and we want to work. And would you, if, would it be okay if we stay here? Some of your poetry. And we began the back and forth uh, of how do you? I mean, because by now I know that it needs to be about twelve stories or poetry or monologues, uh, depending on on, on, the, on the writing. Um, and I get this wealth of material from her monologues. Uh, I think close to 60 poems, perhaps, mm -hmm. at first. <laughs> and how do you do it? So we begin the process to read it in the group, to you know, sort of manage the process so that thematically so that it makes sense, that you can basically you know, throw a, sort of a dart through all of them and say, OK, this group of poems be, you know, belong here, and this group belongs here. It's a massive work. And, and, and Magdalena has been extremely generous, because once we chose the, the, the final pieces, and out of the, those, seven are included in this public publication. So, um, the, we can, then um, I want to say, because we do music theater and musical plays, that our composer and musical director is very much a part of that conversation. There's Mario Guevara, who's right here. And so there he is. Yes. the adapter and director but the voice of the composer That's right. that will comment and will make its own commentary on the piece. So, and I know that Tony also, you know, to the other yeah. pieces, yeah. Okay. Okay. none other than They're not there just to do a musiquita while the actor mm -hmm. does the big thing. Mm -hmm. They have to go through, it's a lot of respect that we believe the company for the role of the composer and the musicians as a core member of the ensemble. So putting together all these, but then she makes it easy because her her work is so has such rhythm <laughs> that we're able to just dive right in. So, so that was a process. But we chose the, the poems, uh, to, 12 pieces, and it's a combination of poems and, and monologues. And some of them are very complex, very different from each other. But to give you an idea of, of sort of the level of connection that you need to have with the author, because otherwise it, it would not be possible, you know, is uh, first of all, the trust of placing of both authors to say to us, 
here it is. Oh my God. <laughs> and they go, okay. Um, and, and, and to have the confidence to go back to her and say, you know, Magdalena, this particular poem, A Day of Awakening, um, it, it says, it goes like this, for you, and then it, you know, it's a series, it's dedicated to the people of Egypt, and we turn it into this universal piece. And, and it's, it, it's talking to them. And when we were doing it on stage, I called her, I said, Magdalena, would you mind if we say for us instead of for you? And she said, of course, it is for us. And we, you know, we're together, we, so, but she, but we needed to have that connection and that trust as to our reasons for doing that. And conversely, she would say to me, you know what, I'm noticing this and that, and only if you want to, she's always been very, very, very cautious, she would give some, some solid ideas on how to approach the piece. The piece. And then there's the role of our ensemble. I mean, ellos hacen el pan, no? I mean, they're the ones who manejan and then need the, the masa so that it finally gets done. So it's, um, it's been a very active process of communication between Magdalena and I and the ensemble as, and the composer and to, to, make, to make this happen, to make this work. Thank you. Um, something that Magdalena said about this really struck me is this emergency to recover empathy, right? And, and I feel theater as a medium communicate, can communicate empathy in a different way than film or television or any some other kind of form. So I wanted to ask Tony and Sonia, since you both of these shows have come from a run, right? You've just recently done a run in, in your local theaters in the hometowns. Um, and if you could talk a little bit maybe about audience reaction to both the book and the show, and if you've noticed that it's creating a sense of empathy for both of these stories really resonate sort of this, this desire to create empathy. Um, can you speak a little bit to that perhaps? I can definitely speak to you know, the response to the to the to the book in terms of empathy. Um, and Enrique's journey is, I mean, I, I would guess at this point is probably the most read book about immigrants in the United States at this point. Um, it's had 50 or more printings, and um, one great aspect of it is, uh, and it, there's an updated version this year, and there's a young adult version and new versions in Spanish, because uh, his story continues, and his story as it continues, it says a lot about massive deportations that are occurring uh, now because he has faced, uh, recently being uh, grabbed by the Border Patrol and, and facing deportation away from his U.S. born um, son, so separation in reverse. Uh, but um, one great aspect of this whole journey for me is that uh, his, Uh, the, the book has really been embraced by educators, and 71 universities have adopted it as a freshman or common read. Hundreds of high schools across the United States, now middle schools with the young adult version, and I think 12 cities have used it as a one city read, like Denver and, and San Diego and other cities. Um, <clears throat> and it, you know, it, it produces different responses from different audiences. Um, But among, it's been widely used in states, and I, I probably give 60 or 80 speeches a year uh, around the country. I, I have like three jobs, but one of them is speaking. And um, I go a lot. I was in Georgia twice in the last two weeks. I was in Birmingham, Alabama. I go to the places that have the greatest <coughs> hostility towards, because from 1990 to 2010, we have the largest wave of immigration in our nation's history. Migrants used to go to six states, including California. In those 20 years, they went everywhere and to places that had not seen immigrants in a long time, and certainly no one who looks like many of us. Uh, uh, and so, you know, I think many educators, God bless them, are trying to counter that hostility. And the response I get from many uh, white students is, um, I was raised racist and anti-immigrant. I was taught to hate all migrants. I didn't know any, but I was taught to hate them all. And Uh, you know, they all tell me I was forced to read your book, uh, and uh, that's how they all start. I was forced to read your book, uh, but and now this has taken me inside one immigrant family, and it's changed my perspective. I didn't understand that what, there was any other perspective other than what my parents taught me or what I saw on Fox News, and um, this has completely changed it. And some of those students have gotten very involved. I mean, my personal opinion about immigration is we need to focus on what's happening in these three or four countries where people mostly come from, uh, so most migrants can stay together as families where they prefer to be, where they're from. 
Um, so many students have built water systems and schools and um, microloan programs and done amazing things, and some of them are the most uh, previously racist towards immigrants. I had a student at Ariz uh, in Arizona, of all places, come up and say I was raised uh, a white supremacist in South Africa, a skinhead in Arizona, and this has changed my perspective. And I have Border Patrol agents who email me saying, I treat migrants differently, women and children differently, now that I've read your book. Um, for many Latinos, it's a different uh, response that I get. It's, um, it, it's, this is my story. Why is it that in school I always have to read all these stories by white dead guys? You know, Shakespeare's great, but there's a real power in seeing my story told and feeling that it too is important and it's part of the fabric of this nation's uh, history and story. Uh, African American students, I had a girl in Chicago at a school say, um, my mother, you know, we, we eat in separate, separate parts of the high school, Latinos and African Americans, um, but I read this, and uh, I was forced to read this, and, uh, and uh, it, you know, I realized my grandmother came north as part of the great migration of millions of African Americans who came out of the South during Jim Crow, and she left my mother behind. And so this is really my, my family story, and I understand these migrants better. So I think it has created, um, you know, you don't want to overplay. It's a book, and we have a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of racism, and we live in a very segregated society. But among the millions who have now read the book, I think that it does take them inside one migrant family. And, you know, many women who read it uh, here in LA, who, who, who maybe are upper middle class, say, you know, it started that first conversation with the woman who takes care of my children or who cleans my home. So I think on many different levels, I've seen, um, I've seen enormous empathy, and I'm very, very grateful for, for what I've seen. That's wonderful. And we, we do have a high school matinee program through a partnership with uh, the Los Angeles Unified School District, and particularly Enrique's journey has really affected these kids. And last week, we had um, a Honduran student who said, this is my story. I was deported seven times before I came through. So it's been very, um, it's had a major impact on students here as well. Absolutely. And I speak at LA high schools, and I one with 2,000 students, and I said, raise your hand if you know someone who's come up on the train, because I didn't want to out right. anyone. And about a third of them raised their hand. So it's a very uh, deeply uh, known story here in LA, personal story, and, um, and it's, it, it's becoming more common as we've seen this surge of kids coming. I was just in Houston, and, um, and actually in Austin, Texas, and they had a high school with 70% Honduran recent arrivals. So uh, we will see more of these children in the, the coming years because the conditions in Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala, where they're coming from, has not it has not gotten any better. What's occurred, uh, lowering the numbers in the last couple of months, is that Mexico has been ordered by us to basically interdict these kids and send them back to often deadly fates. And so Mexico is deporting 10 times as many people now as they were at the beginning of the year. And um, there's all sorts of problems with what's happening politically with these kids right now. But And Magdalena, can you talk a little bit about the reception of your work? Have you, you, know, have you felt that it has created a sense of empathy or identification with audiences, particularly women who are reading your work? Um, and if you just sort of share with us sort of how the impact that it's had on, on your readership. Yes, um, I basically have felt that my entire life. I, I find that people after they either hear me read my work or they see a performance of my work or read my book, they feel very connected to me and intimate with me, but they also feel more connected to themselves. I have a lot of people, which is interesting, men, women, Latinos, African American, Asian, no importa, across class, across ethnicity, across race they read my work or they hear my work and they say, that's my story. Because at its core is, is, is the human story and things that are, you know, impact all of us. You know, we, we are all the victims of tyranny, whether we know it or not. And when people hear the work, especially when, you know, they see it alive at, at Pregones, I, I'm going to defer to Rosalba on that one because she's been at the, every performance. I've been at many of them, I have to admit, I just adore what you guys are doing with the show. Um, but maybe you could speak a little bit yeah, to that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's what I love about it is we just had a, a run with Full House, as well, you ladies, everything. Um, first of all, that our audience is not only 
Latino is also, uh, at least Pastron, I would, I would venture to say that maybe 30% of the house was African American and from other groups. Uh, you're very curious about it because what it does is it gives voice to, to people who just ordinarily wouldn't voice certain things about themselves, especially on the issue of identity. The, the time that you asked before, Chantal, about uh, dancing my cockroach killers, you know, uh, on my way here, um, and it, it's part of the audience's reaction, the last piece of the collection of the Asimai Cockroach Killers, which Elise does so beautifully, River of Recuerdos, uh, points to 16 different types of women. And the, the, one of the most exciting comments I had, somebody came to me uh, last Friday and said, I'm all 16, I'm one by 8 in the morning, one at 10 in the mid-morning, one at 1 o'clock, by 9 o'clock at night, I'm number 16 and no one can come near me. And, and you know, it is a little bit of that, you know, that if I'm La Parejera, I'm La Marimacha, I mean, there's a whole set of 60 women that, that, that we have in there that are absolutely amazing. But also, it, it forces us to confront our own prejudices because a lot of the work in Nazi Michael Grosh Killers, which is why the audience feels so empowered and gives rousing, rousing. Uh, standing relations, uh, you know, uh, in, in New York, and, and, I, and I, I must say that also is very much our life there, you know, uh, but it has become more and more universal, is um, is because it's, um, it, it, it points to things that we have in our own community, and it's not always pointing the finger at the outsider. Uh, whatever, because I am, it's about the fact that we do it to ourselves, sometimes. So when we're staging that piece where we're confronting, confronting our own demons in many ways, you know, do I actually look, do I actually, when I notice that kind of woman coming my way, that other Puerto Rican woman coming my way, and I really like, oh please, you know, it's like, I, it, it, that is, that, but then that person doesn't have a voice, that person has no way of, of telling the world who she really is, but here we are judging this person. There is a whole confrontation of class within our own community that the work also points out, you know, which has to do how we structure our, our class system in our own communities and, and, and how we need to address those things. And, and the piece addresses all of those things. And I think the audience connects with all of these things that you have inside your mind, but you never ever talk about it unless you're in a very intimate setting. And here we are doing it publicly. Mm -hmm. and, and it brings it very close to home in, in that sense. Do you want to speak to Tony about any of the audience reactions you've had in Denver? Yeah, uh, we, the, the biggest, the best reactions, no offense adults, have been <laughs> the, the high school students that we have in here. They are so amazing, they get it. They get it in so many ways. Uh, when we first did the first run, Jose, uh, or Hoser, uh, who does Enrique, they asked him, and the newspaper asked him, how would he compare this to modern literature? And he said, what literary piece would he compare it to? And he said, The Odyssey. And, and for me, uh, I, I mean, that's a smart answer, kid. But, but it's true. Uh, when I read it, it was like, this is like Indiana Jones in a really kind of hyped up way, right? Uh, this kid, as soon as he thinks he gets to one point, something else. So to me, there was an adventure element of it. He's always in danger. He's always on the verge. For me, one of the most profound moments is when he climbs up to the top of the scaffolding after having that, that nightmare sequence and he starts to cry uh, like a little boy, you know. To me, those were those are those moments that I think the kids and the audience they get. They get the, uh, we had a conversation on last Thursday and the kids talked about the fire, about how they got the fire. I've had many adults come to me and go, I don't get the fire thing, what was that about? Right? And, and it's about a boy. And I asked my grandson, what was, he's 14, and I said, what is Enrique's journey? Is it a geographical journey? He goes, yeah, well, that too. But it's a journey to him being, being adult. It's a journey, and it's a journey we all have to take. So the universal element is really, really, you know, really evident in this piece. And I think that's what draws people in. One last quick story. I hope I can make it out quickly. I went to, uh, when we first did it, we did it in Durango, which is in southern Colorado. It's, and it was at Fort Lewis College. And we were, I was this Latino coming in to a program that has a lot of Latinos and Native people in it, but doesn't really, hasn't really gotten a great job or been able to really 
get connect with them. And so I said I wanted to work with the community. Well, they don't know where the community is, so they dropped me off one night at this ESL class. And that's what they did. I said, where are they? Well, I think they're in that building. And, and I went in, and, and I went in by the thing. I'd go with you, but I have my, you know, I have to do something else. That I so I went in, and it was an ESL class. And so I'm conducting this thing in my Puerto Spanish and, talk, and, 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 and talking to them about what we're doing, because what I wanted them to do is I wanted them to come, but I also wanted them to engage and to be there. And, and, I, would, and I started to talk about the scene in the play where they run up and they throw, they think they're gonna throw rocks at them because that's what they've been doing. And this time instead they throw, they throw food. And I said, does anybody, you know, quien sabe que, que, que están tirando? And they said, uh, this woman raised her hand and she said, son milagros. She said, I know this because this is my story. I'm from Nicaragua. And then she proceeded to tell her story about coming in on that train. And it was like 45 minutes of serious therapy, man. It was everybody, this was an ESL class, and everybody's hugging each other, telling their stories. And then, so it's like, you know what? You need to come and talk to my cast. So she came, her name was Jamila, and she came and she told the story. She told the story about being in a room and being, the, the man was coming back to rape her and her sister. And, for some reason, somebody stepped in between them, and it was just that window that they got out, and they were able to get back on the train, and they were able to come. And she said, when you go, she told the students this, and this is something we keep in our, our, our minds as a cast. She said, when you go, you need to go and tell the story, because you are telling our story. We need you to be our voice out there. And so that was, for me, it was a moment where, where, where the art, you know, life takes over art and it melts together. And those kids carried that and we carried that. And so, if you talk about empathy, it put us in a, a very, very different place because it was no longer just an imagine. It, it, it just became a real. In, a, in this town, we never expected this to be. It was all around us, it was all around us. And one last thing about her is that we asked her to come in and be a consultant because she didn't have papers. The university couldn't pay her. So it was, I mean, that was taken care of. We took care of it out of our own pockets to make sure that, that was happening. But it was like, clearly, she was giving us this information that we needed, but still she was invisible with her own story. You know, I don't know if I can add, but I, I've had many similar experiences, and uh, I was in Watsonville, California for one city read, and they handed out 600 copies in Spanish to the immigrant parents. You know, they say immigrant parents won't read, but um, they all read it alongside their high schoolers, and 800 of them showed up one night for me to, to for my talk, and they stood in line for two hours. And every single one of them, 85% of immigrants uh, are separated from a parent, parent in the process of coming here, uh, and every single one of them uh, was crying in that moment. Uh, as I signed their books and um, telling me about their separations. One woman whose son from, she had brought from Mexico and he had been deported back by Border Patrol and she couldn't find him for two years because he had been lost in the child welfare system in Mexico. Um, so um, I, hear, I hear those stories every day from people. And um, the other thing I wanted to say is, um, you know, it's been such a delightful experience with Tony because uh, so so black and white with my experience with Hollywood. Um, you know, uh, Hollywood just doesn't do brown people. And my book was uh, <laughs> I, I, it was uh, you know it was bought by HBO, the newspaper series that led to the book. Um, they worked on it for two three years as a six part miniseries. They've dropped many Latino projects that they've done similar work on. Uh, I think they do white people and black people, but they don't do brown people. And I, it's been picked up by many people since, and now there's a famous Hollywood person who's supposedly interested. So it's been this whole roller coaster ride, and I just came to not believe anymore. And when Tony said he was gonna do a play, you know, it was like, okay, yeah, right. Uh, so, <laughs> so I think I got, I, I interacted very little with you, just assuming that this was not gonna happen. But Tony has done it in Durango and in Denver and here, and he's really seen it as an important uh, story to tell and has done a wonderful job with it. And I think we have to bring our own stories forward because other people won't do it for us. about when you're sharing the story, Tony, I was thinking uh, about validation and, and then the brown people 
thing got me thinking about something that Jose Luis and, and, and I were talking about today, which is about you know the, 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 this brown majority and that that is us. You know, we buy and, one in and, four movie tickets. Exactly, right? yeah. exactly. <laughs> and, and 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 I was thinking how much time, unfortunately, we spend seeking validation from the dominant culture and not cultivating enough validation within our own selves. And I think this is why we love doing this piece, uh, Covert Killers, because it is about that validation that we need to uh, have with, within ourselves. And, and therefore, we need to challenge our own predicaments and, and, and make sure that, that as we, as we um, look ourselves in the mirror, we, we see the clearer picture. And our audiences have taught us that they see it when they see the show. They come back once again and again and say that is me or that was my father or that was my 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 brother. And one of the pieces that that, my, that we show we have um, we call it affectionately Run Boy Run. Um, it was written by Magdalena by her own dad. But I, um, and then Madre de Bomba, which was written. About her grandmother. Her grandmother, I invented because that, that I never met one. That she invented, and I thought, wouldn't it be great if we have these two guys talk about their grandmother? And I sort of shifted genders around to make it work in a different way. So um, those are the the gifts that we get from from good writing. <laughs> so I'd like to open it up to the audience. I'm sure you have lots of questions um, for our panelists, so we can take about 10 or 15 minutes. Um, and entertain some questions or comments if anyone wants to kick us off. Could you clarify the question for me? Because I think there yes. were about seven questions in there. <laughs> <laughs> what, what is the spe specific question? Maybe that moment, in, what is that, that process? In, in, in your moment, in your... In when your I'm trying process. to cultivate empathy within the reader or the, the, the viewer? Is that what you're asking me? So, so I know. Or are we becoming are we becoming immune to violence, right? Or is by creating the examples of hyperviolence, like Robert Rodriguez does, are we actually teaching somebody about violence? Is that kind of am I helping with that? Well, yeah, I was kind of thinking of what is what is that those fine lines oh. I got you, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. When I talk about that that interplay between humor and horror, I I don't believe in mocking violence. And I don't believe in, uh, uh, how can I put it, satire to a certain extent, yes. There's a piece that um, Omar Perez does that's, that's a very interesting piece about, well, how can I put it? When he met me, he was holding the script and he said, are you Magdalena Gomez? Yes. Did you write this? Yes. What's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> and it was a wonderful meeting. But the, you know, <laughs> but the, the piece is, is, is very much outrageous. Um, and it is about, you know, a very profound bigotry against immigrants in the United States. But it is such an absurdity that there is almost like, do I laugh? Do I not laugh? Do I, you know, how do I feel? So I'm not giving anybody an easy out. I don't make fun of our people. I don't. I don't uh, cartoon us. I don't give anybody permission to create mockery of ugliness. What I try to give them 
is a venue from which they can witness it and perhaps experience some self-understanding of how they perceive it. In the case of an offender, my hope is that they will have remorse. In the case of a victim, my hope is that they will feel they have power. So we have to be very intentional in how we choose our words and our placement because oftentimes we do self-colonizing work. And I have seen the colonial mind at work because we live in a plantation in this country. And so we must resist the plantation mentality where we assimilate to accommodate so that we can go into some, some idea of what we perceive as success or acceptance. I don't wish to be accepted. I wish to accept myself. And I hope that my work will inspire people to feel good about who they are. And if they are not good people, to feel remorse. Not shame, because shame doesn't help anybody, just like guilt doesn't. But to feel the true remorse that would make them, my God, that's me. I'll give you an example. In Teatro Vida, the young people created a piece based on a story that there was a, a, a little boy who was beaten with, by an older man with a golf club in our community. The students came to me and they said, oh my God, this horrible thing has happened. So we started to explore cycles of violence, written from the perspective of the young people that I work with. So we look, but they found compassion for that man because what they did in this little news article that was about that big, they found the characters that you didn't read about, like the officer who showed up at the scene the doctor in the emergency room, the mother, the abuela, the co they came up with 25 characters. So from that one article generated all these stories. So um, uh, I, I hate getting old, I'm losing my train of thought too easily these days. But mm, my point is that we create, they created a character of the mother of the man who beat the child and they showed her abusing the child. But then they showed her in a factory and they showed the patron abusing her. A mother came up to the girl, who, she was 18 years old, who played the mother in tears to her. And she said, I wanna thank you for what you just showed me on that stage. I saw myself. And when I leave here, I am going to ask the forgiveness of my children. So not, don't, not only do I choose to write in that manner, but I choose to train my students to write in that manner, in the way of compassion. And I don't separate things into the, the black people or the white people or the brown people or the Asian people or the pe Whiteness is a tumor that can afflict anyone at any time. <laughs> show has this element of witness, right? And I think theater is a medium, the audience literally is witnessing art, but also all of these things are sort of coming through this, this narrative of, of witnessing um, and what is our, our role. So I really appreciate you saying that. Um, other thoughts, comments? Jorge. Well, speaking of parodies of violence, visual artists, there's a moment, there's a wonderful moment visual in this play if you haven't seen it. Interesting, we don't get the same laugh in Denver. Oh. Because you're too far from the border for us. Not at all. For those funny but not funny moments. Right. Or, yeah. I didn't really get to say that. Yeah, right up there. Um, so, well, first of all, I just want to say thank you for the work that you guys are doing. Um, it's really inspiring. Uh, I'm, you know, first generation here, and, you know, my family did it at my 
my whole family's from Honduras, so as you know, this really resonated with me because although this wasn't you know my dad, but this is my cousins and this is everyone. Um, and so I'm a performing artist and also uh, primarily a writer. And I just kind of um, wanted to ask some advice, you know, since you, you have you guys here, um, in terms of your you have a story that's very specific um, to you know a boy from Honduras and, and everything, and this journey that. You know, someone maybe from Puerto Rico might, you know, think it's it's might see it from a def, uh, like a totally different perspective. Um, I lived in Miami. I, I like my best friends were Cubans, but then I also lived here. My best friends were from Mexico. So um, when I try to write, I think of like how to make something that's definitely relatable, but it's you know, so it's universal, even though it's very specific to my culture or to the culture of my best friend. And so I was wondering if you can give some advice on like how to make it so that it's. It's just like this piece, I feel like it's, you know, you guys have mentioned that it's, it's something that resonates with everyone, black, brown, white. For, for me, uh, I, 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 I do this because I want, you know, although I, I play music and I've been on stage and, and, and stuff like that, I've never had the mad passion to be in front of people. Usually I try to fly under the radar because I'm usually doing something wrong. Um, but but for me, the reason, the thing I like is I like being in the audience and having people have the same reaction to what I've, I'm seeing. So what I'm getting at is that I, I dig theater, I dig those moments, I dig that stuff, and I want to create things that I like, that, that evoke an emotion in me or, or stimulate me, or, or stupid jokes that only Jorge and I would probably get, I suppose. <laughs> you know, those, those, those are the things that I did. I, I first said that a long time ago, I used to say I, I, I didn't, you know, I, I got into this thing really just to piss people off. To, to see how much, and then they started liking it, which really threw everything out of whack, right? And so now you try to kind of figure out, you know, what are, how can you, for me it's a lot of practical stuff. How do you do a setup? How do you do the punchline? We, we had a whole conversation about beats. Those kind of things so that people will get to that point of being in a position to absorb that, that kind of point that you're trying to make. And, and, and I think the, that's, that's what makes the arts really, what they are is because it's a universality of, of shared um, feelings, shared emotions, and shared experiences. I mean, uh, the whole concept, I think that a lot of us who are veteranos of the Chicano and Latino art, theater art stuff, I mean, that's been the argument that we made long time ago. Our stories are just as universal as anybody else. I had the same experience with Shakespeare. It's like I would say, we're as jacked up as anybody in Shakespeare. I mean, we stab each other in the back. We still, we do all of those things. You know, I don't need to go to some some place in, in in England years ago. I can find that in my own backyard. So I think if you just go for for what works for you and and, and try to listen, listening. That's the other piece. Is that for me? I just. I, I feel like I had it. I, I really kept thinking as I'm watching this, what did I do? What did I do with this? Because it's Sonia's story and it's Enrique's life. And and what I did, and and thank and, and, and thanks to the collaboration of Dan, uh, Daniel Valdez and the music and stuff like that, you it's like you're just kind of riding that train with everybody else in those moments. I think for me, some of the aside from the music that he wrote, the, the, the great it's a lullaby that becomes really really dark, right? But also the par you know, the the the, the, the parody of, of when you wish upon a star, because it was a, and that came from her because she says they were looking at they, they look at the United States as this place where Disneyland is and if we couldn't come to Disneyland and make fun of Disney, I, I don't know what you know, would there be something wrong with this place, right? So Well, you know and the thing is in in our in our case and I do I, I, I hear what Tony's saying, totally agree with him and uh, the more specific you are, I mean, the more specific you are, the more you will be able to manage whatever it is you're writing. And, and believe me, there will be, I mean, there will be a universal connection to it. The problem when we try to be so universal, you know, when we start doing something and that is not anchoring anything, then it ends up being about anything, about nothing. nothing. You know, so it's just that specificity. And when I say specificity, it doesn't have to be an issue. Or, you know, I, I, I think that um, that's where we begin to, in, our, in, in my case, I just believe that the balance between content and form is so important. 
that is not only about content, it, the form is important. It is how we're going to do, what we're going to say is important, but how we're going to say mm -hmm. is just as important. And I think that's when you begin to make the connections beyond your own boundaries or your own sort of frontier, not boundary, but your own frontier. We have, for example, La Pregones um, exchanges with other companies from other cultures. We have a 21 year relationship with an Appalachian company, Roadside Theater. We are project with New Orleans and New Orleans and Appalachian and, 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 and us for 10 years to travel together with the piece. And when we got together, we each had some horror stories to tell that we got, thought, my God, it's gonna be like a three-act opera with that, you know, it's gonna be horrible. <laughs> the, you know, problem con los puertorriqueños con nuestros problemas y los mineros con los suyos en la montaña y en Orleans y se diga, por dinero. We ended up doing this piece about love mm -hmm. and the meaning of love and the many interpretations of love. And it became such a magnificent thing. And when we did the same thing with a company in Slovakia and a company in Belgium, it was about bridal uh, experiences in our hometowns, you know, and, and, and women and brides. And it was just look for that thing that you, is, is yours to tell, your story is yours to tell, and you'll find that connection beyond your own frontier. I think for me it was, uh, you know, I, was, I really came into journalism as a result of living through parts of the dirty war in Argentina. When my father died, my mother took us back to Argentina where both of my parents were from. And uh, I saw journalists uh, being killed for trying to tell the truth about what was happening with the military taking power and killing 30, disappearing 30,000 people and lived many of those things, uh, disappearances personally in my family. Um, so I became very committed to writing about social issues, social justice issues of people who don't get written about enough in this country, including uh, Latinos. But for me, I, uh, with, within knowing, I, I mean, I think for me, the stories come from, uh, you know, people throw around that word passion, but what, what you care about. And um, I, but within that, I always look for 10 different elements in the stories that I choose to pick. And I think 90% of the success of, of a story is picking the right story. And, one is the, that universal theme where, that anyone can understand, whether it's greed or redemption or a, ho a boy willing to go through a hostile world to reach his mother. Uh, it's conflict in stories. You know, you have plenty of it in this in this story. You need a question that is the engine that drives the story. Is he going to make it into his mother's arm? You need uh, great characters that grow over time. You know, on these trains, you have gangsters who wear rosaries to um, to befriend migrants on top of the train and uh, get to know where they're stashing their money. And then when they're on top of the train, they throw pregnant women down to the churning wheels below. Um, I look for stories with a narrative arc, with a beginning, middle, and end. His mother leaves from a porch in Honduras, and Enrique leaves from the same porch to go in search of her uh, in North Carolina. So I always look for about 10 different elements. The number one element I look for is, does the story move me on an emotional level? When Carmen told me her story, my house cleaner, about not seeing her children for 12 years, the hair went up as it does right now on my forearm. It moved me, and if it moves me, it might move you. So I always look for stories that, that move me, and um, so I'm always looking for those elements that I know work, um, but always within the context of, I wanna write about social justice and, and people who don't get written about enough, women, children, the poor, and Latinos. So, uh, so we're going to shift to the next part where you can have uh, some FaceTime with, uh, with the authors. We're going to move into a book signing in the lobby. So I just wanted to thank our panelists for being with us today.